Hello, I'm Krzysztof Kuse. I warmly welcome all interested guests to the next meeting of the service entitled Physically Cultured Science. This title is a word play translated from Polish. This is the text in the background. I'm not sure if it sounds as good in English. In any case, it refers to the field of sports and health sciences. Uh, during our webinars, we present the projects and research interests of PhD students from our University of Physical Education in Poznań, Poland. Today, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. It is Tomasz Jankowiak, who works in the Department of Neurobiology under the supervision of Professor Jan Celichowski. After graduating his master's degree in sports science, Tomasz was enrolled into a Marcin Bonczyk team to work on the various aspects of spinal motor neurons pathophysiology of the mouse model of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis disease. He is responsible for conducting electrophysiological and immunohistochemical experiments related to this disease and to functional and survival testing. Tomasz is also fascinated by music and his plan for the future is to design a research to investigate mouse motor neuron electrophysiological properties under exposure to low frequency sound waves. By the way, I'm curious to know what type of music it will be. Uh, I invite you to the lecture. I hope you have prepared a cup of tea or coffee, as I did. So please sit back and listen carefully. During the lecture, there will be an opportunity to ask questions through our chat on the right side of the screen. At the end, Tom will try to give answers. Have a nice time. Tom, I give you the floor. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot for introducing me. Okay, now I can see uh, here. Okay, so uh, dear professor, thanks for uh, introducing me and uh, yeah, regarding your interest of what kind of music that would be. Uh, yeah, I, I assume that uh, that would be a techno genre, that for sure. So uh, yeah, but that's a tiny plan for the future. Nevertheless, uh, as for now, I uh, like to say hi to everyone. My name is Tomasz Jankowiak, and I am a PhD student at the Department of Neurobiology, Poznan University of Physical Education. First of all, I need to admit that uh, sharing the knowledge, it is a great thing. So I uh, hope it's going to be a fruitful time for both you and uh, me. So the title of uh, uh, today's presentation exactly matches the future title of my PhD uh, thesis. So here I'd like to introduce you to the research project of uh, Dr. Marcin Bonczyk, a supervisor of mine who has enrolled me into the field of uh, electrophysiology. So what's the plan for uh, the talk? Um, the first part of the presentation, I'd like to uh, introduce you to the general idea of uh, the research project, uh, tell you about um, the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis as, uh, as, the, disease, as the disease to, to present you what's the background of the disease and uh, tell you a few words about the neuron physiology. 
And in the second part of uh, uh, the speech, I'd like to present uh, pre present the results of uh, a given part of the work that we have already uh, finished at the Department of Neurobiology. So uh, the title may seem complicated at first glance. Nevertheless, we got a sign for a consist story, I hope. So uh, let's start at uh, the back. ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It is a neurodegenerative disease that manifests as progressive muscle paralysis. We say neurodegenerative because it's strictly related to the pathophysiology of the central nervous system. The other way we uh, call the, uh, the, the disease is motor neuron disease. And motor neuron is a specific nerve cell. Motor neurons are specific nerve cells. That role is to innervate uh, muscle fibers. So here is our motor neuron. Obviously, it is just a graphical representation. So uh, here it's worth to mention that such a physiological creature as one motor neuron and a given number of muscle fibers innervated by this motor neuron, particular one, is called motor unit. And we know that in the course of the, of the disease, a given subtypes mm -hmm. of muscle fibers degenerate. So the moment motor neurons degenerate, uh, um, degeneration um, occurs and there is a loss of neuromuscular junctions that in turn uh, at the end point of the disease uh, causes um, death of uh, the patient. And here I'd like to also mention that from the onset of the disease, which are for instance, muscle weakness, excessive muscle cramps, uh, around two to five years in average, and a given patient dies due to a respiratory failure. So the disease is uh, quite destructive. Yeah. So here, just a graphical representation of uh, the thing that we just uh, shed light on. So the motor unit to uh, say one like, to, to say one again, motor unit, so a motor neuron and a given number of muscle fibers innervated by this motor neuron. So for, for the sake of the presentation, I'd like to um, tell you that motor neurons uh, innervate uh, different type, different motor neurons innervate different types of muscle fibers. And so S, motor unit, so S motor neuron innervate slow oxidative muscle fibers. FF motor neurons innervate um, to a muscle fiber, so fast contractile fatigable muscle fiber responsible for super fast contraction as the jump as the reflex. And uh, FR, FF, FR uh, motor neuron is responsible for innervating to X muscle fibers that are uh, uh, particular resistance. And we know that in the course of the disease, different types of subtypes of motor neuron differentially uh, degenerate. And the FF motor neurons are the first to degenerate, following the FR and uh, the remaining ones that degenerate, that degenerate at early end point of uh, the uh, disease are the S motor, motor neurons. So here I'd like to shed light on uh, some of the cold facts regarding the ILS, ALS prevalence rate. So two to three people per 100 will develop uh, two, two to three people per 100,000 will develop ALS. And 90 to 95 percent of the cases uh, have no hereditary relationship. It is just sporadic ALS. And the peak and the peak age of the prevalence rate reaches 58 to 63 years. And on the other side, there is the remaining five to 10 percent of cases that are hereditary related. So that means that someone in the past in our family had already suffered from the uh, ALS. And the peak and the peak age um, of the prevalence rate reaches 47 to 
52 years. 10% of all cases begin before age 45 and 1% before age 25. And when we um, discuss some hereditary or non-hereditary relationship, relationship uh, it's worth to mention that sciences have already identified over 50 potentially causative or disease-modifying genes. But for the sake of our presentation, I'd like to focus on the mutation that we can find in the title of the presentation. So the SOD1 mutation here is familial. LS and sporadic LS. We can see that on the diagram, SOD1 mutation. And what does it mean? What does SOD1 mutation mean? So superoxide dismutase uh, one, SOD. It is an enzyme that in humans is encoded by SOD1 uh, gene. And such an enzyme is responsible for removing free uh, oxygen radicals from the body. And the mouse model of ALS, so this uh, so SOD1 G93A mouse model of ALS, it's nothing but a mouse model that the genotype is encoded in such a way that uh, guanine is replaced with alanine at position 93 and chromosome 21st. And such a modification in genotype uh, resembles the phenotype strictly um, close that uh, to, to the human form, to human phenotype of uh, the ALS. So this is exactly uh, the transgenic mouse model that, that we cooperate with during our uh, research, during our um, studies. And when we take a closer look uh, at the neuron pathophysiology, we see that there is many, many different levels of uh, the degeneration. And the question remains how to deal with such a huge uh, diversity of the uh, pathophysiology. Well, first, I'd like to um, tell you that personally, I compare doing physical, doing scientific activity as putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And if we would imagine that our final picture of the puzzle is uh, an answer, it is, uh, it is an answer, for instance, for effective therapy for ALS, or it is a drug for ALS, our final uh, puzzle image. So then, each puzzle represents a given portion of knowledge that we put to that image, a given portion of knowledge that comes from a given group of specialists. And we, um, at the neurobiology department at Poznan University of Physical Education, we deal with uh, an issue of glutamate excitotoxicity, with an issue of glutamate excitotoxicity. So we are able uh, to study motor neuron uh, synaptic excitation and, and intrinsic excitability properties with uh, the mouse model of ALS in vivo. So what does glutamate excitotoxicity hypothesis uh, mean? So first of all, glutamate itself in our uh, body acts as an excitatory neurotransmitter. So it's responsible for transmitting the signal. In our nervous system, neurons communicate with each other and glutamate is an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. Because it's, it's worth to bear in mind that when we talk about uh, levels of excitation in our nervous system, it is a constant battle between an excitation and inhibition. And it's like easily to um, imagine to ourselves that for instance, during a day, we are active, we go to work, uh, we feel hunger, we go to the gym, we study and so on. So there is, um, there is an advantage of the excitation. And during a night, when we fall asleep, there is a night, we just wake up in the morning. So what happened at night? There is a huge, uh, there is a huge advantage of uh, um, inhibition of inhibition, but we study glutamate excitotoxicity. We study how gluta the level of glutamate excitation uh, on motor neurons. So our motor neurons, as previously mentioned, are responsible for innervating muscle fibers. So graphical representation, 
so here is our cell body, the signal is transmitted in here, and motor neuron innervates muscle fiber. So it, its role is to set a motor command to the muscle fibers. And motor neuron to send a signal and to contract, to send a signal so that the muscle can contract, um, needs to receive a, sig a signal as well so that it can transmit it to um, the muscle fibers. So our motor, neuron, uh, motor neurons act as a final common pathway for all the neuronal circuits uh, that are um, engaged uh, into locomotion. So when I think to myself that I want to contract my finger, then uh, the idea uh, the idea appears in motor cortex. So the signal with the descending tracks goes down and input the motor neuron. So, so signal is transmitted through glutamate on motor neuron and motor neuron can send this, pass the signal uh, down to uh, an effector to the muscle fibers. Our motor neurons also receives um, an input from uh, the peripherum, from sensory neurons. And this is exactly uh, the level that we can take that we can take under control uh, with our physiological with, a, with our electrophysiological setup. So the circuit between one a sensory neuron and motor neuron. And obviously, I'm going to explain you uh, why. But first, let's focus on a um, place where one neuron communicate with each other, which is called synapse. So let's consider here is our sensory neuron that input uh, that inputs so much in neuron, and here is the synapse, so place between two um, nerve cells. So a signal that comes from sensory neuron reaches here, the end point of uh, the axon. So exactly this bulb in here, which is the end point, and there is a cascade, a biochemical cascade, during which a glutamate as a neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft. And from the synaptic cleft, glutamate connects, binds to the post-synaptic glutamate receptor and uh, the remaining glutamate that um, that didn't uh, bind to the postsynaptic receptor is just removed um, from uh, uh, is just removed, uh, recaptured with uh, the astrocyte, the other group of uh, uh, neurons. So basically, when we talk about glutamate excitotoxicity, we can imagine that it is an excessive, and uh, this is an excessive. Uh, excitation of the motor neuron due to uh, due to the glutamate due to due to overload of uh, the the the, um, the postsynaptic site uh, because of the um, too much of glutamate as a neurotransmitter. And here is uh, our setup, an electrophysiological setup that allows us to study motor neuron intrinsic excitability and synaptic excitation. So synaptic excitation exactly refers to uh, the levels of uh, how much of glutamate uh, binds to the postsynaptic receptor and intrinsic excitability refers to uh, an, uh, let's say, um, answer of the cell on that synaptic excitation, how cell reacts, how, how our motor neuron reacts for a given number of glutamate that binds to the glutamate receptor and it's able to resend and it's able to pass the signal, signal to uh, the effector. So intrinsic excitability is, is uh, refers to uh, size of the cell, the shape of the cell, to amount of uh, channels that are uh, embedded into the membrane of the cell and so on. Here, regarding our setup and how we are able to study motor neurons, take a look. It is a cross section of the spinal cord. Here is the vertebra, uh, here is uh, the lateral view, and we can see that our motor neurons are located 
here between L4 and L3 spinal segments of the spinal cord. If we take a look at the cross section, it is exactly in here, so in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. This part in here of the spinal cord that, um, that looks like a butterfly, it is a green matter of uh, the spinal cord. Around it is a white, uh, it is a white matter of uh, the spinal cord. So our motor neurons of interest are located in here, in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So what we can do with our setup here, we study 1A apparent uh, excitation on motor neurons. So that means that we stimulate a nerve on the peripherum in here, the signal is transferred backwards to our spinal cord, and here it creates a monosynaptic uh, connection with our motor neuron. So with our microelectrode that should be placed in here, sorry, our micro my, our microelectrode is um, inserted into the motor neuron and we are able to stimulate a nerve on the peripherum and receive uh, uh, and receive a monosynaptic um, signal, uh, a monosynaptic input on motor neuron. So that means that we are able to record synaptic excitation. So the signal transferred in here. And here is the moment where our synapses and where the glutamate is transmitted and binds to the glutamate receptor and in turn activates our motor neuron. Here I'd like to present a graphical uh, representation of uh, how it looks. So again, here is our microelectrode. Here is an electrode that uh, records afferent activity. So when we stimulate our nerve on peripherum and the signal is and the signal is transmitted here to the dorsal horn. This electrode in here is able to uh, record uh, uh, the strength of the uh, stimulation. This is how it looks when we go through uh, the surgery. So here is our uh, TS nerve, so nerve that innervate TS muscle, so medial and lateral gastrocnemius, as well as soleus nerve. And here are our, our TS motor neurons. So how do we know that we record a given motor neurons of interest? So there is such an approach. First, we start to stimulate a nerve in here. So the signal is transferred, is transferred backwards. Okay, so the moment the signal is transferred, it activates our motor neurons. So those motor neurons are ant antidromically uh, activated. And the moment we penetrate spinal cord, we then insert a microelectrode to the motor neuron and can observe that, uh, and can observe uh, on, the, um, on the graph an activity of that motor neuron. So the moment we are in, uh, we are sure that we have uh, caught a motor neuron of interest because this is exactly the one which is responsible for innervating a muscle that is innervated by the nerve that we stimulate. So here the signal is transferred and the monosynaptic connection is uh, activated between 1A sensory neuron and uh, our motor neuron. Here I'd like to show you how it looks, and how would it look uh, in humans? What I mean, our 1A afferent connection. Why do we study exactly this circuit? We study this circuit because it, it's monosynaptic circuits. And imagine that in our nervous system, there are billions of neurons and how to take control under a given circuit. So this is exactly an approach that we go through. And if we would 
if we could do such a uh, experiment in humans, this is how would it look? So our mm, we could stimulate our one a sensory neurons one a sensory neurons through uh, a hammer because our sensory neurons are one a sensory sensory neurons are the neurons that mm, that comes from the stretch receptor, so from the muscle spindles, and our muscle spindles constantly informs our our uh, consciousness about uh, about the stretchness of our muscles. So the fact that I am able to sit to keep the posture is due to an activity of muscle spindles. It is a constant reflex reaction. So. We know how it looks when we hit the hammer on the uh, patellar tendon, then our stretch receptor mm, is activated. The signal goes in here, right here, and create a monosynaptic input on motor neuron. The glutamate is sent and automatically our motor neuron innervate the quadriceps uh, that contracts to prevent uh, a damage. So this is our circuit that we are able to have under control with uh, the mouse model that I have just uh, showed you. If we would dive into the, into the spinal cord, into the ventral horn of the spinal cord, we are exactly in here. This is how our motor neurons on interest uh, look like. So we insert the microelectrode. We are in a cell. So we can record intrinsic excitability, a synaptic excitation. And those gray dots are nothing but uh, figlet synapses. So synapses um, where our glutamate plays a role as a neuro transmitter. So we are able going through immunohistochemistry experiments to, to visualize both motor neurons and uh, glutamate um, synapses on motor neurons. Those green dots here, those white dots are vesicle glutamates. So vesicles are a kind of a bubbles where our glutamate is stored. The moment the signal reaches the endpoint of the neuron, then an active zone where uh, our vesicles are ducked, releases uh, the glutamate to the synaptic cleft. Glutamate binds to the postsynaptic receptor and transmits the signal to uh, the motor neuron in our case. So those white dots are the um, spots where our synapses are located. And if we would take a look, here is our motor neuron. If you would take a closer look uh, on the motor neuron membrane, our membrane uh, is lipid membrane that uh, divides motor neuron on cytoplasm and extracellular fluid. And what do we observe when we are into and when we penetrate the cell, the cell, what we are able to uh, record. So we record a potential, electric potential between intracellular, uh, intracellular um, cytoplasm and extracellular fluid. So difference is around minus 70, minus 70 millivolts the moment our uh, motor neuron do not send any signal, do not fire. So it is a kind of a readiness state of, of motor neuron. It's a minus 70 millivolt. And here are the channels um, through uh, ions um, goes, go. Either they're pumped away from the inner side of the neuron or are pumped in to the inner side of the neuron. So there is a mechanism called sodium potassium pump, thanks to which uh, the membrane potential is kept at minus 70 uh, millivolt. And imagine if those channels wouldn't, wouldn't work as a sodium potassium pump. If our channels would be open, then two forces would, uh, would state about the, the potential between those two sides. First, 
and the diffusion, the force of the diffusion. So uh, the ions would, would seek to uh, equal the concentration between extra and intracellular sites. So then there would be an, an equal uh, concentration of the ions. And the second force is an electrostatic force. So a given ion uh, has a, an electric charge, either positive, or negative. So uh, ions with the same pole would repel each other. So without a sodium potassium pump, those two forces would state about the potential, but there is a mechanism that allows to keep uh, the membrane potential at minus 70 millivolts. And the signal that we talk about while we um, talk about how the neurons communicate with each other. It's nothing but a change, a shift in uh, the concentration of the ions between intra and extracellular uh, side of uh, the membrane. It is a cascade uh, of, uh, of the change of the concentration of the ions between inner and extracellular side. So the sodium potassium pump uh, uses an ATP as <clears throat> as uh, as uh, energy and energy substrate. So going back to uh, sum up, how do we record intrinsic uh, excitability and synaptic excitation? Again, our microelectrode we are we penetrate the cell. We stimulate our nerve so that we so that we constantly activate our motor neuron. And imagine the stimulation is off. We do not stimulate our neurons. So minus 70 millivolts, we remember the membrane potential of the motor neuron, so-called resting state, okay? No stimulus, minus 70 millivolt. And the moment we start to stimulate our nerve with a tiny intensity, we can see that there is a tiny change in the potential. So what happens in that moment? In that moment, the signal goes here, reaches the endpoint, just a few glutamates are released, binds to postsynaptic receptor, and, and the postsynaptic receptor that we can see in here, glutamate binds, opens, and the sodium channel influx occurs. And this is, uh, and this is visible on the graph in here. So from minus 70 millivolts up to um, positive, up to positive uh, state of the potential. And when we increase, when we increase the uh, intensity stimulation in here, when we, yeah, when we just increase the stimulation intensity, then more glutamate is uh, released and we can observe that more channels are open, more sodium uh, ions uh, influx the cell, and there is a, a higher response in electric uh, potential shift that goes to the positive state. So this is our approach to take under control the synaptic excitation, so how much of glutamate can um, can we send to the postsynaptic side and how uh, our cell reacts, how our cell reacts, so intrinsic uh, excitability. So here, going to uh, the second part of the presentation, acute and long-term modifications by TSDC, by TSDCS. Uh, so this is what is left to explain. DCS, DCS, so transpinal direct current stimulation. Uh, so for these of you that are not accustomed with this technique, TS, DCS is a neuromodulatory technique, uh, non-invasive neuromodulatory technique that uh, states as a technique uh, which allows us to introduce an electric field within the functioning uh, spinal networks. So we can apply an active electrode and passive electrode and create an electric field between those electrodes and uh, thus uh, modify synaptic excitation. So you can imagine that, that if 
an electrophysiology of the cell is about a move of an ion. So when we just put a given uh, area of interest under an impact of the transpinal direct current stimulation, it reacts to, uh, to the field, to the electric field that we, um, that we create, either anodal or cathodal. So when we, when we turn on the current, we can play with uh, different uh, location of the electrode, with the time of polarization and intensity of the polarization as well. And the question remains, why do we want to provide uh, transpinal direct current stimulation to our motor neurons? And going back to synaptic, uh, going back to glutamate excitoxicity hypothesis. So when we talk about this hypothesis in ALS, imagine a situation that you start to suffer from ALS the onset of the symptoms occur. You go to a doctor and in doctor, it's observable that uh, your motor neurons fire too excessively. So the answer is that there is, uh, so, so the answer is that there is um, an overload of the motor neurons uh, excitations through the glutamatergic input. And this is true, because most of uh, the study that uh, was conducted about the glutamate levels uh, was conducted during a symptomatic stage. And the moment a patient starts to uh, reflect the symptoms of the disease, many of subgroups of motor neurons have already degenerated. And those that are left somehow take over the job of those that degenerated. So we observe uh, excessive, we observe uh, the overexcitation of uh, the glutamate. But the question is what happens in presymptomatic stage? And here are a few articles that prove that in presymptomatic stage of the ALS, we observe some opposite to the hyper-excitability hyper hypothesis uh, um, happening. So there is hypo-excitability. So the cells, our motor neurons in presymptomatic stage of ALS uh, are hypo-excitable. And here we can see the level of the ex excitation. So the EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. So the change of the potential that is provoked through the um, activation of the postsynaptic site through the glutamate and an influx of uh, the sodium. We see that in mutants, so in SOD1 mouse model of ALS, in presymptomatic stage, we observe uh, statistically lower uh, um, EPSP site. It is observable in here as well. So there is an average 30 to 40% decrease in synaptic excitation levels in presymptomatic uh, mouse model of ALS. So it seems that uh, not hyper excitability, but perhaps hypo excitability is, uh, is uh, a phenomenon that um, provokes the degen degeneration in into um, into to, to motor neurons because as I mentioned when we study presymptomatic stage then we observe hyper excitability because the ones the one motor neurons that um, that are left are hyper excitable intrinsically this is the first thing and the other that they need to take over the uh, the work of those that already degenerated. But in presymptomatic stage, we observe that motor neurons are uh, less excitable than, uh, in, in, than physiologically. So here, it is a work of a supervisor of band, Dr. Martin Bonchik. It was shown that with use, uh, with the use of pharmaceutics and with the use of chemogenetic approach, we can restore the level of EPSP, which in turn, uh, which in turn 
can <clears throat> restore the level of the PSP, and we observe such an activity-dependent neuroprotection process. So we observe uh, a decrease in disease marker levels through restoring the EPSP size. So when we restore the synaptic excitation level, when we allow uh, the cell to uh, work physiologically, then we observe uh, an, a decrease in uh, the disease uh, burden. So somehow automatically what comes to my mind, uh, what comes to, 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 to mind is uh, first that both pharmaceutics as well as chemogenetic approach are cost, highly cost. It takes at least eight, 10, 12 years to introduce a given therapy drug uh, in the market. So DS, DCS seems to be uh, non-invasive, low cost and quite a um, safe method to alter synaptic excitation levels. So this is why we decide to introduce TSDCS in uh, the research based on static electrical, electrophysiological properties of mouse spinal motor neurons in presymptomatic stage to study if we can restore uh, the levels of EPSP. So to study if we can bring the physiology if you can bring the physiological state of synaptic excitation to uh, the physiological level, and in turn, if that has uh, any positive impact on mice survivability as well as uh, the locomotion. So here, the chronological order of experiments that we have uh, performed. First, we studied an acute uh, impact of 15 minutes TSDCS on motor neuron electrophysiological properties. So the goal was to introduce an electric field for 15 minutes, either anodal or cathodal, and to study electrophysiological profile of mouse spinal motor neurons. Short-term effects, it, that means what is the change in EPSP and intrinsic excitability of the cell during the period of polarization, polarization, so during 15 minutes, and then sustained effect. So what happens with the cell up to 15 minutes after the current is switched off? In the second uh, series of uh, experiments, we, uh, we decided to uh, study prolonged two week impact of 15 minutes polarization on electrophysiological properties as well of synapse morphology and uh, at the end uh, what we haven't analyzed yet and the lifetime TSDCS so each day during the life course of uh, transgenic mouse model uh, polarization group either anodal or cathodal and to study an impact of TSDCS on motor coordination and the survive uh, ability. <clears throat> so let's take a closer look at our experimental design. So this is exactly what we have already uh, um, went through. So intracellular recording. So we penetrate our cell here, electrical stimulation of the peripheral nerve, TS nerve, so the nerve that innervate TS muscle, so we can study uh, egg, synaptic excitation and intrinsic excitability. And 15 minutes of polarization period, either anodal, one group, the other group, cathodal. So, so what we just add this time is the electrode that uh, is responsible for uh, creating an electrical field within the functioning spinal cord. So between this active electrode and this clip, crocodile clip, so-called in here, we create an electrical field and we study um, the change in uh, potential of uh, the cell. So anodal TSDCS, uh, what we can observe here is the control group. Here, here is the, sorry, here is the control uh, result of the of, of the um, of the EPSP size here is anodal polarization and post polarization period. So we observe that anodal polarization 
of transgenic mouse model of ALS, there is a significant increase in EPSP amplitude during 15 minutes of polarization and up to 15 minutes after the current was uh, switched off. We also observe a significant uh, change with significant change in one a afferent activity as well as in uh, um, more depolarized membrane of the motor neuron during a polarization uh, period. So anodal TSDC, TSDCS significantly um, significantly increases EPSP uh, amplitude in transgenic mouse model of uh, ALS. And that is exactly uh, the summation or the, the summary of uh, the 15 minutes acute anodal polarization on, um, of the motor neurons. And here the cathodal group, we observe an opposite effect. So the EPSP uh, amplitude, the EPSP size decreases significantly. So synaptic excitation is lowered. We can also observe here a uh, change in membrane potential. So we remember uh, the work of Dr. Marcin Bonchik, where I talked about the fact that they aimed to uh, bring the physiological uh, the physiological um, activity of the cell, and it did it with, with pharmaceutics and uh, uh, chemogenetics. This is exactly what we were able to do with the TSDCS, and. Here, sustained effects. So, quite similar protocol, but as we, during the first protocol, so in here, were able to penetrate the motor neuron, stimulate the nerve for 15 minutes, and then still while being in the same cell, record both intrinsic excitability and synaptic excitation up to 15 minutes, the current result, then to study an impact of TSDCS up to two hours, on um, electrophysiological profile, it's it's just uh, we're, we're not able to do so because it's not possible to keep the stable um, motor neuron penetration for more than 30, 45 minutes. So our approach was to, before the polarization, record different motor neurons, study electrophysiological profile, then turn on the current, either, either anodal or cathodal, and then again, penetrate spinal cord uh, and penetrate motor neurons to study the effects. So taking into consideration this approach, we observe in here that anodal polarization was um, able to increase significantly the size, the size of EPSP amplitude in uh, SOD1 mouse. So anodal polarization uh, significantly increases the synaptic excitation of uh, uh, the motor neuron. At all, there is no prolonged effect. And here we, uh, here we published the results of uh, the first series of experiments in neuroscience journal. And obviously here is some, uh, some more detailed uh, explanation of uh, the research of the work and uh, the things that uh, we uh, were able to study during the, the, the first series of experiments. Here I'd like to focus on uh, the second series, so an impact of two-week polarization on electrophysiological profile. So one group each day for two weeks or 15 minutes, either anodal polarization, another group, cathodal polarization, and the control group, so-called sham group, that was under anesthesia, but no current uh, applied within the functioning spinal cord. So what we observe, to our surprise, both cathodal polarization and anodal polarization significantly increased the EPSP amplitude. So both cathodal and anodal polarization 
after two weeks of uh, um, applying the current significantly increased and excitatory postsynaptic potential. So we increased uh, the level of synaptic excitation. Here is exactly the uh, result. Both cathodal and both cathodal and anodal in comparison to the sham control group that were that was only under anesthesia, it's um, up regulated. And just to just to your knowledge and to take uh, a little deeper look onto morphology of 1A synapse. Glutamate receptor, when it's released and bind to the postsynaptic ampaglutamate receptor, we observe, as we previously mentioned, that in presymptomatic mouse model of ALS, there is hypo excitation uh, visible. So, so the, the level of synaptic excitation is decreased. And that is due to a disruption of the postsynaptic GLU R4 subunit AMPA receptor uh, <clears throat> architecture. So glutamate receptor is built up, uh, is built up with few subunits. And one of, one of those subunits is disrupted. Uh, GLU R4 AMPA, GLU R4 subunit of the receptor. Well, we know that with pharmaceutics and chemogenetics, we can restore uh, the, the architecture of this AMPA, of this uh, subunit of uh, the glutamate receptor, and and does and does uh, bring the excita excitation back to the physiological level. And regarding our study in here, there is a question: What is behind? What is behind? Uh, the change in the level of synaptic uh, excitation. And as we can find, as we can try to find an explanation uh, regarding the casodal polarization here in a shift and input resistance of the cell. So the question remains, what happened to anodal polarization when there is no significant change in any other intrinsic excitability and synaptic excitation mm. Uh, uh, <clears throat> levels. Here, some morphological, uh, some morphological experiment we performed, and in order to study the possible, um, explain the possible uh, background of uh, the shift in EPSP size, we can see that with anodal group there is so much more of those gray dots. And we remember that the green dots represent uh, figlut one synapses on motor neuron. So we can um, we can try to explain an increase in PSP size with an increased uh, an increase um, level of figlut one synapses on uh, motor neurons. We do not know as for now what. Uh, what happens in here with the cathodal polarization and an increase with the uh, EPSP size. Um, it is to be studied. Of course, we go through those experiments. Not all of the groups uh, uh, has been studied yet, as well as, uh, as for now, there is, uh, <clears throat> we haven't uh, gone through uh, the um, lifetime uh, experiment so that I could uh, show you some of the results. But as for now, this is what we uh, know. So to be done, study an impact of lifetime TSDCS, either another or, or cathodal or motor abilities and survive ability of uh, transgenic mouse model of ALS to, and analyze confocal images so that we know what, uh, what happens in the background of the electrophysiological um, graphs that we can observe. So team and support, what is obviously extremely important to mention and the references. And thank you for your uh, attention.
sorry, I'm back because I had to turn my speakers on. Okay. Here I'd like to introduce you to uh, the next presentation that uh, uh, Jakub Marinovic is going to present uh, the next week. And here we have also chat, but there are no questions. So if there are no questions, then I think we are done. So obviously, thanks everyone who attended. And in case of any questions, I am open to uh, I am open to conversation to talk about those aspects.